At the Pivotal Summit in Brussels, EU leaders have appointed Antonio Costa as the new president of the European Council, Ursula von der Leyen as the president of the European Commission, and Kaya Kallas as the high representative for foreign affairs and security policy. Now, these appointments come at a crucial time for the European Union as it faces numerous internal and external challenges. Joining us today on TVP World to discuss the implication of these new leadership roles and what they mean for the future of the Union is Piotr Kaczynski from the German uh, Foundation. Hello, sir, and welcome to TVP World. Uh, hello, good to be back. So we are looking at these uh, new appointments to these top job positions finally uh, being secured. Now, can you tell us whether or not this means that going forward we will see a direction that's similar to where uh, the EU is heading? Is this a continuation of the former policies or do you think the new people in charge will take it to a different uh, direction? Well different people at different time because Antonio Costa is secured. Uh, he will take office on December 1st, mm -hmm. so there's still a couple of months right. uh, to go. And then there's a big question, of course, about Ursula von der Leyen because uh, she hasn't been appointed, apparently. She only has been formally uh, made a candidate. <coughs> so she's a candidate now, formally a right. candidate. And then election is in the European Parliament. And whether the Parliament will actually uh, uh. elect her well, this is a big question for now. Right, very much so. As we saw that the uh, European Parliament election that just took place not long ago, well, it did take a little turn that was not very much expected. So do you think that might actually throw a wrench into things, especially seeing that Ursula von der Leyen is not without her own uh, controversies? True. And uh, the, big, uh, the big coalition that Ursula von der Leyen had over previous five years, and this relates to your first question, whether we'll see the same outcome, the same policies as before, uh, is probably not enough. And uh, the EPP is still the largest, they increase their, uh, their, their share of seats in the parliament, but then SND is about the same, but the shrinkage, the implosion of the centrist uh, uh, group, uh, the Renew Europe, uh, makes a new opening, it means there will be a new opening. And whether this new opening will be towards uh, political, uh, let's say, positioning of uh, Italian Prime Minister um, uh, Giorgia Meloni, or whether it will be more towards the Greens uh, in this, uh, in this parliament, parliament, remains to be seen. <laughs> right. And, uh, well, a lot to dissect here. And one of the things that you brought up that kind of brought to my interest is the fact that uh, there's an implosion of the centrist kind of parties like you mentioned. And I was wondering, would that lead to some of the politicians in the European Union having to lean either to the more right or the left extreme in order to garner enough support? In a way, there's, a, there's like a uh, like a big watch uh, under which uh, they are operating because uh, for the moment uh, there are just a few, just a handle of uh, politicians in the European Council who may have been, uh, let's say, um, far right, right? Uh, Meloni herself, Orban, uh, uh, the, the Prime Minister of Hungary, maybe uh, Prime Minister of, of, of Slovakia as well, but not too, not, not too many people. But wait for uh, next summit when there will be a new prime minister from the Netherlands. Wait uh, for another prime minister coming from Belgium. And if we have five uh, already uh, prime ministers who are coming from far right, uh, that's going to be a very different uh, uh, conversation. Uh, so this is exactly what this European Council is about. Mm. Uh, this is about securing next mandate for five years because in, in, a, few, in a few weeks we will see probably different, uh, different European Council. Also, French elections are coming. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we're going to be looking at French election real soon. And of course, it's always going to be uh, very relevant to the uh, European direction going forward. And I would like to draw our attention also to uh, the uh, council meeting that just taken place. And of course, a lot of reports are coming out that during this discussion, Maloney has been somewhat sidelined from the discussion. Do you think politically it's a wise move to do that? As you mentioned, uh, her decision or uh, her supporters might actually have a say in the outcomes of uh, be it von der Leyen or the direction of the union going forward? Well, we shouldn't look at it as it Italy being sidelined. It's not about sidelining this big country, big important country. It is about sidelining somebody who is in the middle of, let's put it this way, um, <clears throat> or organizing their own uh, hair uh, party. 
because ECR is her party. She is the president of European Conservatives and Reformists. Uh, so she is the president of this party. And this party uh, should be, and this was the, uh, the news, uh, should be the third biggest uh, group in the European Parliament, right? But in the European Council, there's only two people uh, who are coming from this uh, ECR. Meloni herself and the Prime Minister of, uh, of Czechia. And Prime Minister of Czechia said, no, no, I'm actually in, uh, I'm supporting Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, von der Leyen. So <clears throat> what is going on? Meloni doesn't have a group inside European uh, Council. That's her problem. Uh, the, the group in the parliament is, where is it? Because it's a, uh, on paper, it's a third uh, a group in the parliament, but Polish uh, Prime Minister, uh, the ex-Prime Minister, Morawiecki, just put a big, big bomb uh, for the ECR last, uh, last couple, what, what was it, on Thursday as well, uh, when he said, basically, maybe law and justice will leave ECR. So more questions than answers. Right, right, exactly. We're looking at these kind of uh, European politics being rearranged in a way that is going to be very unpredictable going forward. So do you think that the strategic agenda they're laying out uh, is one that, like you mentioned, is to sort of future-proof, to make sure that the direction stays stable, even if there's a big shuffle when it comes to the personnel or even the parties that's running the show? remains to be seen. Uh, the last strategic agenda was adopted in 2019, soon after COVID hit, uh, the war in Ukraine uh, started. Um, so what will be the next events that will come our way? And to have a strategic agenda like the Union has right now, adopted every five years, all right, there's a paper. But whether this lives up to the day and to the task, it will be checked against the clock mm. uh, in one year, in two years down the road. So this is the vision of today uh, of this European Council laid on paper and then it's sound. Uh, whether it's soundproof uh, remains to be seen. All right, so for all these agenda that's being laid out, what, what, what are the ones that you think are the uh, most uh, important and when it comes to, uh, well, the next five years? There are probably three things that are outstanding here. Mm -hmm. First is the security situation. Uh, there's a, there, it's a big security situation on a big scale. We have a war next to us, actually two wars, if you consider also okay. Israel. Um, and, uh, and then all those security questions uh, that are going for what, what, what is going on between EU and NATO, mm -hmm. uh, how to organize uh, ourselves if Trump is the next president in the US. Uh, more questions than answers. Security, one. Second, economy. Economy is super important right now because uh, economy, we are in the middle of the transition and we need a lot of money to, for this transition. And where is this uh, uh, money is coming from? How to, how to um, finance our transi transition? This is a big question out there. Right. And we saw, for example, this big uh, problem between EU and US about IRA um, funding scheme. Um, and the third question is, of course, what's going on with the Green Deal uh, and this uh, energy transition. Right. Like I said, the transition requires a lot of money. And of course, uh, one of the big topics being discussed is also competitiveness. And I think that along with the Green Deal and the transition period that requires a strong economy actually do come into clash with each other. Only, but probably not as much as a lot of people would like to believe, but it still kind of interacts. Uh, how are they going to strike a balance going forward? It's a great question. Uh, this is a, a central question for uh, the EPP-led uh, next European Commission under uh, von der Leyen. And where is this, this golden middle? Because on the one hand, uh, there are those progressive uh, party uh, parties saying, yes, there is going to be green growth. Right, uh, and we need to invest into modern technologies, uh, and the, the innovation will drive our economic growth. Fine, but then there are those thousands of little questions to little businesses and big businesses out there. How do they scale in uh, those uh, transition questions into their business models? And uh, it, it's a big question for big let's say car producers, but it's also a big question to smaller companies out there. And uh, those answers have to be positive. And then we will know whether this is going to work or not. So Ursula von der Leyen, she's going to give us a big speech probably in either July or September about exactly this. 
how to go forward uh, about uh, the transition and economy, about comp competitiveness. All right, like you mentioned, uh, this kind of topic is usually very touchy, especially just before the European Parliament election. All the polling data were showing that a lot of people are concerned about whether or not this balance can be struck between like going green and uh, uh, boosting of ec economic comp competitiveness. Yes, and the EPP in their manifesto, they, they put uh, the green solutions as a part of the struggle towards competitiveness. Mm. So you see kind of a, a, a shift in, in, in how, well, how do we uh, position our, our objectives here? Are we struggling towards competitive uh, economy and then we have green solutions to this uh, objective? Or actually, as previous five years, we were targeting towards, um, uh, let's say, a neutral, climate neutral economy. Right, so the, also the framing of the message is something also very important, right? To be able to communicate that uh, well to the electorate is something that is also very difficult to do. Thank you so much for all your input and insight. It really helps break down the European politics situation. Really appreciate it. Thanks for being with us on TV. Thanks World. for having me.